Welcome to Plant-Based Kidney Health. I'm Michelle Krasmer here with Dr. Hashmi. And the question for today, Dr. Hashmi, is what is IgA nephropathy and how does someone know if they have it? Yeah, this is a great question. And I could have swore we did this topic, but it's my fault that I can't remember. So let's start with the basic. What the heck is IgA nephropathy in the first place? Now, the old terminology was Berger's disease. That's what they used to call it back in the day. And essentially, all it is, is literally the name says it all. It's immunoglobulin or IgA that essentially builds up in the kidneys. And what's IgA or immunoglobulin A? It's nothing more than a protein. Now, what's interesting about IgA nephropathy is actually the most prevalent glomerular nephritis across the world. So when we say prevalent or common, what we're really saying is the incidence ends up being roughly around two and a half people every 100,000 populations per year. So it's not a very large number, but in terms of all of the glomerular nephritis and kidney disease, we talk about this one is something you want to know about. And the folks that end up being at the greatest risk are the ones who are Asian descent, European descent, and on the opposite end of the spectrum, the lowest risk happens to be with blacks. Now, the good news about IgA, unlike most of the diseases we've talked about, when we say, what is your 10-year risk of going on to dialysis? Another term we use in kidney diseases, what is the risk of losing 50% of your kidneys? So at 10 years, the risk is about 26% of the people will go and have either dialysis or have a 50% decline. So in other words, even if you have this diagnosis, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of treatments, and it's a very slowly progressive disease. Now, the thing to note about IgA is in terms of the lifespan of people, it really peaks in the second, the third decade, and that's very common for us where we tend to diagnose it at those ages. So it's very rare I'll diagnose somebody who's much older than that. But unfortunately, this is a disease where men are twice as likely as women to be effective. Now, what's interesting, and, and I don't have a clear uh, pattern to this, but there is a family inheritance pattern to this. So in other words, in some families, you will find that multiple generations have had IgA. Interesting. And how does someone know if they have it? Like, are there signs and symptoms that are different from, you know, kidney disease, we think a lot of times people don't have signs and symptoms until it's late stages. Um, is that the same with IgA? And how would someone know or what would get tested? So, yeah, so this becomes a little bit interesting. Now, if you have certain risk factors, for example, your ethnic group matters. So like we said, Asians and European descent matters. But if you have certain diseases, you're also more likely to have IgA. For example, if you have liver cirrhosis, specifically alcoholic liver cirrhosis, you're more likely to have IgA. Remember, IgA is just a protein that's being overproduced. If you have hepatitis B or hepatitis C infections, those are also linked. And one of the things we've talked about before is celiac disease. In fact, in celiac patients, as much as one-third of them can actually have IgA nephropathy. So all of those sort of comorbidities are linked. And there are certain bacterial infections that can trigger an inflammatory cascade that can cause an overproduction of IgA. And then lastly, it's HIV. Now, in terms of the symptoms, what's important to understand here, the symptoms are similar to other glomerular nephritis. So in other words, if you see that you have blood in the urine, that can be a sign of kidney damage. It could be also a kidney stone. It could be a urine infection. So if you have blood in the urine, you want to take that seriously. But more importantly, some people present and they say, you know, my urine looks like the color of not coffee, but like cola, like Coca-Cola. That's how it literally looks like. And that's where we want to make sure we test. Also, if it's tea colored, all of that could be a breakdown product, it's blood going, or it's myoglobin going. Now, what happens in a lot of folks is that these common symptoms are present in about half the people who have IgA, the tea-colored urine, the uh, cola-colored urine, or even blood in the urine. But in about 30 to 40% of the people, they have microscopic hematuria, which means that you can't detect it. Your urine looks okay, but you check it at a doctor's office and there's blood in there. And then only about less than 
roughly 10% or so people, those are the ones that will have what we call that tr typical traditional foamy urine that looks like a bubble bath. That's only less than 10%. And remember, that severe foamy urine really means you have nephrotic range of more than three grams of protein in the urine. And then in terms of like pain in the kidneys, that's really rare. But, you know, every once in a while, somebody comes with pain in the kidneys. We do the full workup. We still have to do a biopsy to find out what's going on. You talked about things like swelling. So swelling in the feet and swelling sometimes goes all the way up and there's swelling in the hands. That's a much later stage. And that really means there's nephrotic range proteinuria or proteinuria greater than three grams. Other things are weakness, fatigue, because you're losing all your protein, all your albumin in the urine. High blood pressure is very common. And part of that is, is because as you start to lose all your protein, you hold on to water. That water raises your blood pressure. So we'll see high blood pressure going on. Other things are most common when you're really at the last stage, meaning you're about to go on dialysis. So if you have itching, muscle cramps, nausea, vomiting, um, loss of appetite or anorexia, all those things occur because there's too many uremic toxins that are forming inside your body. And as you know, uremia can even cause people to be severely confused. So bottom line on this is the only way to make a diagnosis is a kidney biopsy. There are no blood tests that you can do that can give you an answer for IgA. Got it. Okay. And how then do you treat someone with IgA? So IgA treatment, and it's similar to the general principles of all other diseases where we have protein in the urine. The goal is, is to get the protein that you're spilling in the urine to less than 500 milligrams a day. So, of course, your first line agents are going to be things like your ACE inhibitor or your ARBs. Those are all the prills, analapril, lisinopril, benazapril, or losartan, herbisartan. All those artans are going to be the other one. In addition to that, there are other things that are available. For example, now we have started using SGLT2s on everyone who has proteinuria. SGLT2 inhibitors are amazing. The most common one is the flozin, empagliflozin or Jardians is one that's used. And then there are some newer kits on the block. And those are where we combine drugs. So in this particular case, it's combining an ARB plus an endothelin-1 antagonist. The combination of those two is actually really effective. Now, it is new, it's expensive, so a lot of folks don't use it, but you can still get fantastic results with an ACE inhibitor, ARB, and SGLT2 inhibitors. But then you get into the second category. The second category is the ones we call higher risk. So let's say you've tried these first agents. The protein in the urine is still greater than a gram. It's not coming down. Now you go to the next agents, and the first line treatment really is steroids. So what happens with steroids, and we're talking things like prednisone, of course, what happens with steroids is there are all of these nasty side effects. So a lot of people either don't want to take them or can't tolerate them. So if that doesn't work in my own practice, my second line agent is CellCept that I go to. So the important thing in IgA is you do want to capture people who are early in the game because if you get somebody whose kidney function is already less than a GFR of 30, your steroids and your cell set most likely is not going to do a whole lot. So generally speaking, if their GFR is less than 30 or if the kidneys are already shrunken or they got a lot of scarring on the biopsy, we don't start them on immunosuppressives because the risks outweigh whatever little benefit you could get. Now, in some academic centers in some other places, they also use an alternative to prednisone where people say, you know, they can't tolerate prednisone. That's budesonide. And budesonide is a steroid. But what's interesting about that is, is there's a couple of things that happen. There's a version of it, which we call, it's an oral targeted release formulation. Why is this so important to know? Because what it does is when it goes into your body, the first pass metabolism, which means when you take it orally, it goes to your liver, 90% of it gets cleared by the liver on the first pass. 
So you're wondering, well, what the heck is the point of taking a drug that 90% of it is gone? It's because you don't need it to go inside the body. Where you're really targeting is the part of your intestine specifically that we call the distal ileum. And this is where your IgA1 protein is really made and it kind of gets all you know, out of proportion and all messed up. If you can target it right there, calm that process down, you have done what you needed to do. Then why would you need the prednisone to go inside your body? So budesonide is very interesting. There's some limited data there that's coming out that's helpful. Now, those are the main treatments. But the stuff that people forget is if you are overweight or obese, losing weight makes a huge difference. Protein restriction matters. You know, when you're spilling protein, people think you have to eat more protein. But if you eat more protein, you spill more protein. So it's a little bit non-intuitive on what people end up thinking. You are going to see that people's cholesterols go like crazy. Their risk of heart attacks goes like crazy. So we want to give them cholesterol medications. If they have a lot of swelling, we'll give them diuretics to get rid of that swelling. And of course, with that swelling, there's blood pressure. So we'll give them blood pressure medications. So those are all of the treatments in a nutshell. So then, Michelle, when it comes to these folks, what about diet? Any special diet considerations folks should think about? Yeah. So, I mean, just as you mentioned, some of the things that we, traditional things for kidney disease, but especially for proteinuria. So the reduced protein diet, low sodium diet, especially for helping with blood pressure control, um, more plant proteins over the animal proteins. Um, another thing, since we just think of this whole, um, you know, inflammatory thing going on is get, making sure people are having high antioxidant diet, you know, getting lots of fruits and veggies in their diet, minimally processed, not a highly processed standard American diet. Um, things like, you know, omega-3, so ground flaxseed, walnuts are, and again, this is across all people with kidney disease, but we are very focused on that with IgA and nephropathy as well. And then just like you had mentioned that there is that link between, there's a big link between gut health um, and IgA nephropathy, as well as a higher risk for IgA nephropathy with those immune um, mediated bowel disease like celiac disease. So there are some, you know, animal studies that look at gluten-free diets um, and, you know, see some promising effects. I think the thing is, is it's something that might help someone with IgA nephropathy is on top of these other things we talked about, looking into considering a gluten-free diet and seeing if that helps, but it's not this across the board thing, like everyone with IgA nephropathy can't eat gluten and has to follow gluten-free. It's kind of another thing in the tool bag that can be you know, tried, but the most important thing with that and that I can't stress enough is it's not a highly processed gluten-free diet. It really needs to be a minimally processed whole food, more plant food, and then you're choosing those gluten-free grains um, over the grains that contain gluten. So the ones that have gluten are the wheat, barley, and rye. And then there's lots of gluten-free, you know, more grains are gluten-free actually than not. So, um, you know, your quinoa, your millet, your certified gluten-free oats, um, what is it, teff, amaranth, buckwheat, those are all examples of gluten-free grains. Um, but again, overall, it's just, it really, um, it's those typical kidney ones. We want to help do things with the diet to reduce the protein in the urine, to reduce inflammation, and then that can be tried in there. Um, so then, I mean, outside of diet, or what about, are there any supplements? Or I mean, we always get asked, are there supplements I can take to help with my, you know, blank? So are there supplements with, that can help with IgA nephropathy? Yeah, the, unfortunately, the short answer is no. And the one thing that I want to point out to everybody is, is please do not delay seeing your nephrologist over any kind of supplement or any kind of diet. You can't do that. There's a finite window. And if you have too much scarring, you're going to miss it. Now, a lot of people talk about fish oil. The problem is the studies that were done, half showed a benefit. The other half didn't show a benefit. And the dosages that they were using were about three grams or more. So this isn't stuff you can get over the counter. This is highly purified omega-3s. And highly purified omega-3s, unfortunately, usually means you're getting a prescription. So in other words, fish oil, could it help? 
Maybe, but we don't know. The idea that could it harm, most likely not. Now, if you're taking that much fish oil, you are going to get some of the worst heartburn ever. So you just want to know about them. There may be potential cardiovascular benefit. There may be benefit migraines. It may be benefit with depression, dementia, etc. All of those are there with omega-3. So you're not going wrong by doing that. But if you're just hoping it will help IgA, the answer is no.